Paul. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Yeah. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham, and I refer to his letter today responding to questions from me. He took on notice in question time yesterday. In his letter, he states, and I quote, Minister, St Minister Taylor has always declared his interests as required under both the House Register of Interests and the Ministerial Code of Conduct, end quote. Does the Minister stand by his statement as set out in that letter? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, to the best of my knowledge, Minister Taylor has always declared his interests. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Why does Minister Taylor's statement of registrable interests under the House Register of Interests fail to declare his interest in Jamland Proprietary Limited? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, Mr. President uh, Senator Wong is making an assertion there. Uh, it's an assertion that uh, is one, of course, I can uh, take on notice in terms of having Minister Taylor uh, respond to as to whether or not the assertion has any validity or not. Uh, I would, of course, uh, not, uh, not take Senator Wong's word for that. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. I have, thank you, Mr. President. I have in front of me ASIC extracts that demonstrate that Minister Taylor is a director of Guffey Proprietary Limited, a joint holder of a one-third interest in Jamland Proprietary Limited. Given these extracts clearly show that Minister Taylor's interest in Jamland Proprietary Limited, will Senator Birmingham now correct the record and apologise for misleading the Senate? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I've already indicated I don't take uh, the Senator's assertions at face value. I have already taken Order. on I I I Senator have Wong, already taken Senator on Birmingham, Sen Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong's seeking a point of order. Order on my left, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. I seek leave to table the ASIC document confirming that Minister Taylor is, has an interest in Jamland proprietary limits. Senator Cormann. Uh, th th order. On, a, on, a, on, a, on a point of order. Uh, now, S Senator Wong has, uh, is a long-serving uh, senior senator. Uh, senator Wong knows about the conventions in this place when it comes to seeking leave uh, to table uh, documents. And like, if the appropriate courtesies uh, are uh, displayed, then the government will give leave, but not uh, in the absence of uh, complying with the normal courtesies. Order, Senator. Um it is not a point of order to seek leave. I grant the Leader of the Opposition some liberality in an application. Um, it is not a point of order, though. I call Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, as I indicated, I have already taken on notice at the first supplementary uh, the assertions that Senator Wong is making. Uh, if there is anything to be brought back to the chamber in relation to those assertions, I will bring it back as I responded promptly to the questions that I took on notice yesterday on behalf of Minister Taylor. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the government is on the side of Australian workers, including by helping Australians export to the world? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Antic for his question and congratulate him on his first question to, uh, to the Chamber. I welcome him to the Senate and note that, perhaps unlike uh, some others, uh, Senator Antic is happy to come into this question and ask questions about policies and ask questions about issues that matter to Australians in terms of job creation for Australians, in terms of business growth for Australians, in terms of the types of opportunities that, that are important to keeping our economy strong, to keeping Australians safe and secure economically, and indeed the trade policies of this government have been central to providing those types of enhanced opportunities to Australians right around the country, especially in our home state of South Australia. And it is wonderful, as always, to have a new Liberal senator here from the state of South Australia. Mr. President, Mr. President, our trade policies have seen successive agreements sealed and delivered, and they stand in stark contrast to the record of those opposite who are unable to commence and conclude trade agreements when they are in office. Our government has been able to get on with it. Agreements with China, with Japan, with Korea, with the ten economies of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, our pursuit indeed of the PESA Plus Agreement, our agreements with Indonesia, with Peru, with Hong Kong. All of these agreements have enhanced the opportunity for Australia's businesses to be able to export more, to be able to grow and ultimately to be able to contribute to the record levels of jobs growth that we've seen in Australia. 
It is no coincidence, Mr. President, that the trade growth and the expanded market access that the Liberal National Government has delivered for Australia's farmers and Australia's businesses has helped to fuel an increase in the number of businesses who export, an increase in the volume of exports, an increase in the value of exports from Australia, and ultimately more job opportunities for Australians. And it's those job opportunities that are central, and that's why we are going to continue to work to expand those opportunities for Australia's exporters. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the minister inform the Senate about any recent achievements, especially in wine, which is very important to my home state of South Australia? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, a critical industry, of course, in our great state of South Australia is the wine industry. South Australian wines, I'm sure, are enjoyed by nearly every member of this chamber. I would hope by every member indeed. I know that Senator Farrell has a strong and abiding interest in the South Australian wine industry and one that, uh, one that we share. And Australia's exports of wine to key trading nations such as China, Korea and Japan continues to grow. Export data from Wine Australia shows that Australian wine exports to China reached a record high during the 18-19 financial year of $1.2 billion, increasing by some 7 per cent in value. Australia now exports more wine by value to China than any other nation around the world. Now, this is a proud accomplishment for Australia's great winemaking industry, and they've been able to do that in part because of the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, uh, which has seen Australian wine exports to China grow by more than 180 per cent since coming into force, creating Order, massive Senator opportunities Birmingham. for businesses. Senator Antic, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how do Australia's free trade agreements create more opportunities for Australian businesses and exporters? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, they create the opportunity for Australia's businesses and exporters to be able to land their goods, their services, their products in markets at a more competitive rate than their competitors. And that is the key thing here, to be able to get into the market with the least amount of cost, impost or barriers for those exporters. That's why we continue to pursue new market opportunities. That's what we'll be doing in the negotiations for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. It's what we will be doing in our negotiations with the European Union. And I do warmly welcome the statement of the incoming president of the European Commission, uh, who in her policy agenda has stated very clearly the priority that the EC places on finalising quickly an agreement with Australia. We stand ready, willing and able to negotiate quickly and to finalise an ambitious and comprehensive agreement with the European Union, as we do with the UK, should circumstances allow, as we do with our regional trading partners, all of it to keep creating more job opportunities Order. for Australians. Senator O'Neill. Oh, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, I understand the government will give leave, and I seek leave to table two ASIC documents that show Mr Minister Taylor's uh, relationship to Guffey Proprietary Limited and the ownership of Janlam Proprietary Limited, a third ownership being uh, in the hands of Guffey Proprietary Limited, Mr Taylor's company. Leave is granted. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In question time yesterday, Minister Taylor told the House of Representatives that, and I quote, I have no association and have remained at arm's length at all times from the company Jamland. Does the Prime Minister accept Minister Taylor's assertion? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, yes, uh, he does. <laughs> Senator O'Neill, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Taylor is a director of Guffey Proprietary Limited a joint holder of a one-third interest in Jamland Proprietary Limited, a company under investigation by the Department of Environment and Energy for allegedly poisoning hectares of critically endangered grasslands. How is this consistent with Minister Taylor's assertion that he has, and I quote, no association and have remained at arm length, arm's length at all times from the company Jamland? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, minister has addressed these matters in detail yesterday. No doubt, no doubt, the opposition has the opportunity to ask the minister questions on these matters directly uh, in the House of Representatives today. Uh, also, uh, both uh, ministers, uh, Minister Birmingham and myself, uh, have made uh, relevant statements uh, to the Senate, and I can again confirm that the Prime Minister has confidence uh, in Minister Taylor. Senator O'Neill, final supplementary question. In question time yesterday, Minister Taylor told the House of Representatives that, and I quote, I have always disclosed my interests 
and they've been very clear about those interests. If Minister Taylor had disclosed his interest, how could it be possible that his own secretary was not aware? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh Mr. President, uh, the Honourable Senator is indeed right. Uh, that is uh, what um, Minister Taylor has made very clear, that he has always declared his interests. Obviously, uh, you know, the interests uh, have to be declared in the appropriate way, consistent with the rules in relevant chambers, and uh, I'm confident that that's what's happened. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister, last week Four Corners showed the heartbreaking stories of families torn apart by China's mass incarceration of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. More than one million people have been put in massive internment camps, including those who call Australia home and those with relatives in Australia. Minister, I welcome your intervention to request that Saddam Abu Salamu's wife and baby son be allowed to travel to Australia. As far as the government is aware, how many Australian citizens are currently in Xinjiang and what is your government doing to secure the release of other Australians and their families like fast-tracking visa processes? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Di Natale for his question. Uh, in relation to uh, the numbers of Australian citizens or permanent residents uh, of Australia, uh, who may be in Xinjiang. We are aware of a number of cases uh, where um, people have travelled to, uh, to the region. Uh, some of those uh, also have Australian connections, um, such as um, spouse visas or, or associations like that. Um, if Australian family members have requested us to do so, we have made inquiries with uh, Chinese authorities regarding the whereabouts uh, of those individuals. I won't go into uh, further sp sp specifics, um, Mr. President, because there are, of course, privacy obligations uh, attached to, uh, to these matters. It is also important to note that uh, where we are talking about non-citizens, so um, uh, those who have Australian connections or, or are permanent residents but are not citizens, there are limits uh, to some degree about what Australia is able to do for, in terms of the level of consular assistance that we are able to provide uh, to those uh, individuals. Senator Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, I just wanted a point of order. I might have stood up just before the minister stood, um, well, uh, sat down. Well, the minister has concluded her answer. Okay. So well, it's opportunity well, for a supplementary question. Well, perhaps the minister could clarify the question of just how many citizens there are. I think you mentioned several, but I'd, if you've got a number, I'd appreciate that. Now, the Chinese government are committing cultural genocide against the Uyghur people. We're seeing unjust incarceration, forced polit political indoctrination, restrictions on movement, intrusive surveillance and religious oppression. Following our joint statement at the UN Human Rights Council, what are the next steps and how is Australia working with countries in the region to generate action through the United Nations? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Di Natale for his questions. Uh, I don't have a confirmed number of uh, individuals, and uh, uh, it, it does uh, move around because different cases are notified to us at, at different times. So I would not like to, uh, to venture uh, an inaccurate number uh, in terms of that. Australia has taken this uh, situation and raised this situation, Mr President, in the most serious of, of ways. And the, the senator has referred to our statement in the uh, Human Rights Council, of which we are a member. Uh, we continue to engage with Chinese authorities, uh, particularly in relation to consular matters and any support um, that we seek for those who are not Australian citizens as well, but associated with China. Uh, and in terms of uh, next steps, we seek support of uh, the government uh, in China uh, and have continued to do so for an opportunity to visit the region uh, and also to uh, enable others uh, to visit the region, uh, which they have indicated in the past uh, there is some, uh, some preparedness to do. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. I'd ask that you take the question of the number of Australian citizens currently in Xinjiang on notice. Minister, given the devastating scale of repression, when will the Australian government impose targeted sanctions like visa bans and asset freezes against those linked to abuses in Xinjiang? Minister, what will it take for the government to take action in the face of these horrific, gross violations? Senator Payne. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. I will take uh, Senator Di Natale's question about uh, numbers on notice and see what information I am able to uh, to provide. Uh, and I've already uh, indicated, Mr. President, uh, the uh, steps that the government is taking, the issues that the government uh, has raised. Uh, I have. Uh, I don't agree with the approach uh, that the Australian Greens uh, suggests uh, in this regard. I think it is very important for the government to work uh, in the way that we are, and we will continue to do so. Senator Patterson. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia. Minister, as you do, no doubt know, Australia's resources and energy export earnings are on track to reach a record $285 billion this financial year. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal National Government is on the side of Australian workers, including by ensuring that Australia's energy export industry remains strong into the future, particularly in my home state of Victoria? Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Patterson for his question and, and recognise that his home state of Victoria has, a, has made a proud contribution to our nation's resources history, indeed, in some respects, is the home of our resources industry, going back to the days of the gold rushes and, in more recent times, uh, the, the use of its extensive uh, brown coal resources and oil and gas resources has played an enormous role in developing our nation. We are also seeking to make sure that Victoria, in particular, continues to contribute uh, to the future strength of our resources sector. And that's why it was so great last week to join my good friend and colleague Senator Birmingham and, uh, and, and Minister Tim Pallas from the Victorian government to uh, turn the first sod on the hydrogen energy supply chain project in Victoria. An extremely exciting project for our country. Uh, it's a $500 million uh, project which builds on the best of what we have done in the past to develop our resources sector uh, to create future opportunities. It is involving the best science and technology that we have in this country. The CSIRO has been involved. Uh, our chief scientist uh, was there as well, Dr Alan Finkel, and he has been involved. We have a proud history of being at the cutting edge of developing resources and energy for the world, and we have a new opportunity here in hydrogen. It also builds on our record of working with other countries to supply their energy and resource in needs. This $500 million project is jointly funded by the Australian, Victorian governments and uh, Kawasaki Heavy Industries from Japan. The Victorian and Australian governments are both contributing $50 million to the innovative project and the Kawasaki Heavy Industry Company the balance. So we're working with our partners to supply the region, to develop stronger relationships to the north as well. And of course, it is using our natural resources to create jobs, to create opportunities for Australians. That has allowed us to build a prosperous nation in this country, and we will continue to support and do that in this Liberal National Government. The hydrogen industry potentially creates a new opportunity for those brown coal resources in the Latrobe Valley and jobs in Victoria. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what else is the government doing to support the development of a hydrogen export industry and create more jobs in regional Australia? Yeah. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, um, uh, Mr. President. And, uh, uh, this project, while very exciting and, and a world first project, uh, for the first time creating a liquefied transport of hydrogen to the world, uh, is not all what the government is doing. The, the uh, Australian government recently has also contributed another almost $50 million in funds for uh, 16 different hydrogen projects that have been funded by ARENA. Uh, $26 million has been provided to the Future Fuels CRC to undertake research and development on uh, how to adapt existing infrastructure to hydrogen. And Dr Alan Finkel, our chief scientist, has been tasked uh, with developing a national hydrogen strategy, both for the Australian government but also to contribute to the Council of Australian Governments when working with other resource and energy ministers across Australia uh, to jointly develop uh, our hydrogen resources and grow this industry for our country. It is a very exciting opportunity that will take decades of work uh, to deliver uh, on the potential promise of hydrogen, and we have committed to that and will to continue to build with other like-minded countries in the world to develop this industry for Australia. Mm -hmm. Senator Patterson, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what are the risks to Australia's strong resources and energy export sector? Senator Canavan. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, um, Mr. President, to develop these types of industries, we need strong political support, obviously. And as I did mention, it was uh, good to join uh, the Victorian Minister Tim Pallas there in Victoria, and I recognise their support for this project. There are those that oppose this project, though, and saying we shouldn't use our brown coal resources. They're terrible and evil and all these sort of things. And this project will generate around uh, 100 tonnes of carbon dioxide. I was uh, told or advised last week that that would be about 15 to 20 
uh, trips from Melbourne to London on a, on a business class flight. So, you know, it's one sort of climate change conference, this particular project, perhaps <laughs> much less than that. Um, it's a very important innovation that we do this and support these projects. And I also call on the Victorian government to support the development of their gas resources, not just their hydrogen resources. Hydrogen potentially has enormous potential for decades yeah. to come, but we need Victorian gas to develop soon rather than later to make sure we protect the thousands of manufacturing jobs that exist in Victoria today and hopefully will exist in the future, providing we have common sense from the Victorian government soon. Senator yeah. Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Is it not the case that the Woomera Prohibited Area, the WPA, is a unique national security asset for testing advanced defence capabilities for Australia and our allies? Is it not the case that the review of access arrangements for mining and other activities within the uh, uh, WPA undertaken by, for defence by uh, Dr Gordon de Brouwer recommended, and I quote, a key uh, consideration for defence when it assesses WPA access applications should be whether companies have substantial Australian ownership, control and influence. What then is the government's approach to the, the expansion of the magnetite mining and transport operations in the WPA being planned by Chinese-owned uh, company Suyu River Mining and its Chinese-owned partner Yuyang Mining Australia? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick, for your question, and thanks very much for your interest in Australia's most important weapons testing range, and which is also a very significant national security asset for this nation. Uh, you raised two main issues, and I'll go to the first one in terms of the area itself. The area provides defence with a unique capability for the testing and evaluation of capabilities because of its size, its remoteness, its low population density, and also its quiet electromagnetic uh, environment. Defence is the primary user of the area. However, in 2014, a coexistence framework was introduced. And under, and under this framework, any non-defence user wishing to access the WPA must hold the relevant permit or permission to do so under defence's legislative framework. And this does include defence's permission for any variations sought under existing permits. Now, in relation to the part of the question about um, Dr De Brewer's uh, review, uh, I can confirm that on the 11th of May 2018, uh, Dr Debrow was appointed to lead a review of the Woomera Prohibited Area Coexistence Framework that you referred to. Uh, this review builds on the establishment in 2014 of the existing coexistence framework that seeks to balance interests of all users in the WPA. Now, the, th this review uh, did reaffirm the need to restrict access and access only uh, in, in relation to foreign uh, investment proposals. Now, on the 29th of March this year, the government announced it supports the findings and the recommendations of his review. Now, these uh, findings do reflect the enduring and critical importance of the Woomera prohibited area to, as I've said, to national security, while also recognising the considerable value the area holds for Aboriginal cultural heritage, mineral resources, pastoral operations, and environmental research and other scientific activity. So, yes, we did support all the recommendations. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Yeah, sorry, Minister, you didn't really go to the intersection of uh, CU River Mining's uh, uh, um, operations in the uh, Woomera pro prohibited area, but I'm also interested in uh, CU River Mining have procured uh, an area near Port Augusta for transshipment. Uh, that may involve the uh, introduction of Chinese vessels into uh, the Spencer Gulf, noting that Coltana training area is, uh, is, is nearby. Are there any risks and uh, uh, what is Defence doing in respect of that risk? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Patrick, for that question. And in relation to the Coltana training area, uh, all applications uh, for access are assessed on a case-by-case -case basis given the sensitivity of the area. And the safety and security of defence personnel and facilities are regularly reviewed for any potential changes in circumstances, so I can confirm that is the case in relation to that question. Uh, in relation to CU River, uh, all applications for access to the WPA are assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, given the sensitivity of the area. Uh, defence determines the access conditions based on its legislative framework and the need to preserve safety and the security of defence activities in the area. Uh, Defence also considers the security implications of any foreign ownership, control or influence that an applicant may have before granting access. Uh, CU River has an existing mining permit for operations at Cairn Hill within the WPA, which remains in force until August 2024. 
Uh, CU River does not have defence's permission to access its exploration tenements Order. or to establish Senator further Reynolds, mines time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, noting you mentioned uh, foreign interference, uh, the, one of the directors of Yuyang uh, Mining Australia is a former cabinet minister and senator, Nick Bolkus, and he's recently registered uh, under the Foreign Interference uh, Transparency Scheme, effectively acknowledging that Yuyang uh, Mining Australia is a company uh, with a foreign government-related entity. Uh, noting that, uh, what are your concerns in respect of their operations in the WPA? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Patrick, for that question. And what I would say is, as uh, you've indicated that Senator, Bol Senator Bolkus has done, is that all companies consider their obligations under the scheme. Now, whether a person or an entity itself is required to register will depend, of course, on who the foreign principal is, the nature of the activities undertaken, the purpose for which the activity is undertaken, and also, in some cases, whether the person has held a senior public position in Australia. Um, the Foreign uh, Inter Interference Transparency Scheme commenced on the 10th of December last year, as we know, and its purpose is to provide for the public and government decision makers with visibility of the nature, level and extent of foreign uh, influence on Australia's government and political processes. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Patrick, on a point of order. Just on a point of order, I'm, I'm trying to get to uh, the concerns that you have in respect of the established foreign in influence in this particular case. On the, uh, on the WPA. Um, on the point of order, Senator Patrick, that was the final part of your question. Um, the minister is allowed to address in other parts of the question. Um, you've reminded her of that. I call the minister. Um, Mr. President, what I have done is uh, advise Senator Patrick of the process which applies to all applicants and anybody. So the same rules for everybody under the FITS. So what I've said stands in relation to CU. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question also is to the Minister for Defence. Minister, given the unprecedented investment in Australia's naval capability and specifically the continuous shipbuilding program under our naval shipbuilding plan, uh, can you update the Senate on how this benefits Australian workers? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Fawcett for that question. And I also congratulate him for his deep and enduring support and engagement in the delivery of defence capability and, in particular, our shipbuilding program. The Australian government, I can confirm to the Senate that the Australian government is investing an unprecedented $90 billion through the naval shipbuilding program in new naval capability for this nation. As our region and our oceans become more contested, increasingly so, we need new capable marine platforms that will deter threats to our interests and also provide for our security. This is why we are investing in the largest regeneration of our Navy since World War II, and I am delivering a plan that will see Australia deliver 12 attack-class submarines, 12 Arafura-class offshore patrol vessels, nine hunter-class frigates, 21 Guardian-class patrol boats, two mine countermeasure support ships and one hydrographic survey vessel. This government is building 57 naval vessels in Australia by Australians with Australian steel. The major invest this major investment will provide capability for the surveillance Order. and protection of our maritime approaches and the ability to operate with our partners seamlessly. The capability will make a real contribution to peace in our region for decades to come. Also, it will enhance the ADF's capability for regional humanitarian relief and disaster relief which is crucial to our support and work with our partners in the Indo-Pacific. To deliver this capability, we are taking a whole-of-nation, whole-of-industry approach, which is exactly what is required for Australia to succeed in this important national endeavour. I've also had the opportunity in recent weeks to visit South Australia and to see the work already underway to build our air warfare destroyers and the first of the offshore patrol vessels. It is fabulous and wonderful, and I'm so proud to see the progress and the work that has been Order. achieved Senator by Reynolds. this side of the House. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline what recent steps have been taken to build Australia's sovereign industrial capability to support this naval shipbuilding endeavour? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Fawcett. Um, Mr President, this government is transforming the relationship between defence and the defence industry here in Australia through a clear, long-term plan to strengthen Australia's industrial base. 
Already, the implementation of the $90 billion naval shipbuilding plan is well underway, as I've said, with the construction of the Arafura-class offshore patrol vessels and also, I'm very pleased to say, the Guardian-class Pacific patrol boats in my own home state of Western Australia. The Morrison government is making a $1 billion investment to construct the world's most advanced shipyards in both South Australia and in Western Australia. This work is well underway in creating approximately 15,000 skilled and professional jobs across these programs. Real jobs in Australia, unlike what you did not deliver. So, so through you, Mr President, how many, how many Australian built ships order. did those opposite deliver? None. They didn't order a single order. one. Senator Reynolds, but time for the program, answer has expired. Uh, Senator Carr. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on other elements of this capability renewal plan? Senator Reynolds. Senator Fawcett, I'd be delighted to. This government is transforming the relationship between defence and defence industry. And recently, I had the opportunity to visit the BAE Systems Govan Shipyard in Glasgow, in the United Kingdom, where I experienced firsthand the build progress on the city-class Type 26 frigate for the Royal Navy. The design that will form the basis of our new Hunter class frigate. During this visit, I announced the latest Australian supplier, the Australian supplier, to be awarded work through the 20, Type 26 supply chain, the Adelaide based company Airspeed. This is just one of many examples of the government's support to the Australian defence export sector. And I'm also pleased and I was very proud to travel to Cherbourg in France to attend the launch of France's first Barracuda-class submarine with President Macron and my counterpart, Minister Pali. Strong engagement with France is critical as we embark on delivering a strategically <laughs> vital capability Order, supported Reynolds. by a strong industrial base. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the Australian reported that doctors, specialists and surgeons are rotting Medicare at record levels to line their own pockets and rip off hard-working taxpayers. They stated that last month a record of $4.5 million in rebates for bogus health services provided to supposedly sick patients was identified by the Professional Services Review for repayment. After recouping $10 million in 2017-18, $20 million in 2018-19, the Medicare watchdog expects to recoup a further $30 million this financial year. Minister, given these phenomenal rises in bogus rebates claimed and recouped, is the government's increased and welcomed compliance efforts unveiling a rotting crisis in our long-trusted system of Medicare? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, President, and thank you, Senator Bernardi, for the question. Uh, fortunately, Senator Bernardi, largely our doctors uh, do the right thing. Uh, of course, those who don't do the right thing and who overcharge we seek to, as you've quite rightly said in your question, uh, recover funds that have been overtaken. Uh, last year, we introduced to the parliament the health legislation amendment, improved Medicare, Medicare and compliance and other measures, bill to implement measures announced in the 2017 budget to support the integrity of Medicare and the pharma pharmaceutical benefits scheme. The bill delivered savings of $103 million over four years, which aligns uh, with the, the sorts of numbers that you're quoting in your um, question, uh, and, and those numbers are based on increased and earlier debt collection figures. The measures in the bill support the integrity of Medicare through improvements to the recovery of arrangements uh, for Medicare debts owed by, to the Commonwealth, and these improvements will allow uh, compulsory offsetting of future medical, Medicare uh, benefits schedule MBS payments to, made, on, made to providers on behalf of patients, bulk billing patients, introduce garnish she arrangements uh, for providers who do not bulk bill, and make administrative arrangements more consistent across the three acts and deal with businesses' billing approaches that impact on claiming by providers. 
Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, the article reported that a sleep specialist billed the same Medicare item number more than 5,000 times in 12 months to claim $1 million in bogus rebates. A surgeon billed more than 17,000 services and a GP more than 15,000 services in one year, both clocking up around half a million dollars in stolen taxpayers' money. Can the minister shed further light on the nature and patterns of these growing Medicare abuses in the states and communities most prone to such crooked activity? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Bernardi. Um, I think the point that I would make is uh, that we have put in place measures to uh, continue to enforce compliance with uh, the, the Medicare schedule process. Uh, if anyone has specific cases that are being raised, uh, we are happy to hear from them because we have processes in place that we can uh, undertake to make sure that debt recovery is undertaken. And I've mentioned that in my answer to your primary question. We do have uh, capacity, Mr. President, to make reference to the AFP and their Medicare fraud. Uh, a squad within the AFP that can under, undertake investigations, uh, and there are processes through which we can uh, continue to work through the, through the AFP to recover debts as well. Senator Bernardi, final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Minister. These doctors are clearly rotting the system and effectively stealing from taxpayers. So, can you advise me how many Medicare provider numbers have been removed from these practitioners? or how many have been deregistered as medical practitioners as a result of investigations and this criminal conduct? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I don't have specific details on that information with me, surprisingly, uh, but I'm happy to take that on notice uh, and we can provide that back to you and to the Chamber. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to the report of the Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet in relation to the application of the Statement of Ministerial Standards against former Ministers Pine and Bishop. Does Mr Morrison guarantee the accuracy of the report? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Well, as I've indicated to the Chamber before, uh, the uh, Prime Minister, on the basis of Dr Parkinson's report, um, has uh, confirmed that there is no breach uh, in ministerial standards. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The report states that, and I quote, Mr. Pine advised me that EY is a client of GC Advisory, which is a public affairs strategic communications advisory company co owned by Mr. Pine and Mr. Adam Howard, Mr. Pine's former chief of staff. The Australian Government Register of Lobbyists lists Adam Howard as the sole owner of GC Advisory and does not list EY as a client, which is correct. Dr Parkinson's report or the Register Order. of Lobbyists. Senator Kitching. Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the Prime Minister, uh, of course, uh, completely uh, accepts the advice provided by Dr Parkinson. The is Senator Kitching, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that Dr. Parkinson's report now contains at least three errors of fact under question, how can the Prime Minister possibly rely on this report? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, uh, President. Uh, I don't accept the premise of the question. Senator Smith. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government is delivering on its Pacific step up? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith for his question and his interest uh, in these key issues, uh, because this government recognises the importance of both meeting the challenges and the opportunities of our blue Pacific continent, Mr President. That's why, in consultation and in partnership with our Pacific neighbours, the Australian government is implementing our Pacific Step Up. Security, economic growth, Closer people-to-people -people links so that they can prosper are the fundamental principles that underpin the step-up. And I'm pleased to say that we are delivering on our commitments. The Office of the Pacific has been established in my department to make sure that all arms of government are working toward, the, to, working toward this goal together. 
We've signed memoranda of understanding with 10 countries now, Mr. President, to join the Pacific Labor Scheme, which will create economic opportunities and build skills for Pacific Island workers and support regional and rural economies in Australia. And this month, the Australian uh, Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific also opened for business, which will work to address the infrastructure needs of the region. They are, Mr. President, considerable indeed, estimated by the Asian Development Bank to uh, be at over $46 billion US in the period from now till 2030. The Coral Sea Cable System, Mr. President, which will deliver faster, cheaper and more reliable connectivity and communications for Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, is on track to be operational by the end of the year. Indeed, the cables have landed in the Solomon Islands uh, in Honiara and in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. And we're building on our people-to-people -people links uh, through our shared love of sport and uh, our shared love of competition in sport, I might add, and also our church partnerships program, which is a very powerful and engagement between Australia and our neighbours. Both the Prime Minister and I have demonstrated our respective commitment to the Pacific with our regional visits since the election, and indeed I look forward to discussing Pacific priorities further this week at foreign Order. ministers' meetings in Suva. Senator Payne. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how Australia is working in partnership with Papua New Guinea to increase their prosperity and security. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. This week, the Prime Minister very proudly hosted Papua New Guinea Prime Minister <laughs> James Marape as a guest of government and the first guest of government visit since the election, which speaks volumes for the importance of this relationship, a relationship that we've also announced we will elevate to a comprehensive strategic and economic partnership. And I'm pleased to say that within that, Australia and Papua New Guinea have agreed to a range of new initiatives that will build both the breadth and the depth of our partnership in health, in defence, uh, with uh, policing and in a number of other areas. We're working in partnership to grow Papua New Guinea's economy, including through the Coral Sea Cable, as I mentioned in my earlier uh, response, through the Papua New Guinea Electrification Partnership and our Transport Sector Support Program. We're investing in a range of new projects in Papua New Guinea's energy sector to both reduce costs but, really importantly, increase access to power. We're supporting plans to refurbish hydroelectricity plants and to build a new solar power plant and a new gas-fired power plant. We're committed to working side by side with Papua New Guinea to advance the common interests Order. of our Pacific Senator family. Payne. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise how the government is working with like-minded nations across the region to build regional prosperity, security, and stability? Senator Payne. Thank you very much. And it's fair to say that engaging with our partners in the region is a core part of the Pacific Step Up. We're not alone in our commitment to a stable, prosperous and secure region. And our partners, including New Zealand, the United States, France, Japan, multilateral agencies, are strongly committed to the development of the region. We're collaborating with the United States and Japan under our trilateral infrastructure partnership. And the PNG, uh, Papua New Guinea Electrification Partnership that I referred to earlier is a really good example of this effective partnership approach through which we are working with Papua New Guinea themselves, with Japan, with New Zealand, and the United States to support the Papua New Guinea government to achieve its goal of providing electricity to 70 per cent of its population from the current level of 13 per cent by the end of 2030. Projects are underway to achieve that aim, and it is truly transformative for Papua New Guinea. We are also engaging closely with the private sector and with civil society to ensure that we maximise the potential Order. of our Pacific step Senator up Payne. to strengthen the region. Senator Walsh. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The government is undertaking a retirement incomes review. Will the Prime Minister rule out any cuts to the pension? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. The answer is yes. But of course, the question is: the question is, will the Labor Party rule out their throat thirty billion dollars in higher taxes on Australia's retirement savings? Oh, 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 so I've, I've already answered the question. But of course, this is a contest, this is a battle of ideas. We stand for lower taxes. We stand, of course, for uh, sustainable funding of all of the essential services Australians rely on, which, of course, also includes our appropriately well targeted but generous welfare safety net. Uh, we are putting that on a sustainable fiscal foundation and trajectory uh, for the future through our stronger 
economy through a plan to build a stronger economy. But what is the Labour Party doing? The Labour Party went to the last election promising $397 billion in higher taxes. There was the retiree tax. Then there was the $30 billion in higher taxes on super. There was the higher taxes on housing, on investment, on income, you name it. So, you know, under this, under, under this government, the Australian people can be confident that the pension is safe. Under the Labour Party, it wouldn't be. Because under the Labour Party, under the, Labour Party the economy would be weaker, the, the economy would be weaker, the budget would be weaker, and of course, uh, funding for the essential service would, would be on a weaker uh, trajectory for the future, which is, of course, why no doubt the Australian people uh, chose to re elect us to form government uh, at the last election. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Prime Minister rule out increasing the pension age beyond 67? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we have absolutely no intention of changing the pension age, and, and I'm quite happy. And I'm quite happy. And I'm quite happy to rule it out. I'm quite happy to rule it out. But I, you know, you know who increased the pension age to 67? I'm just trying to remember who Order. was that? Who was that? That is that the, the godfather of class warriors. The godfather of class warriors. The former member for Lily. The former member for Lily. Uh, what was his name again? I'm just trying to remember. I think it was Wayne Swan. You know, Wayne Swan was such an amazing uh, treasurer, such an amazing Labour member uh, for the great state of Queensland that Labour's primary vote in uh, Senator Watts' home state of Queensland is down to 22.6%. percent 22.6%. 22.6%. That is because the Australian people understand that under Labour and the higher taxes, class warfare, anti-business agenda, the country would be weaker and they would have less opportunities to get ahead. But we will continue to build a stronger economy and better opportunity for people Senator to get ahead. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In an article entitled Liberal MP Craig Kelly Wants Family Home Included in Pension Asset Test, New Daily has reported that Mr Kelly has spoken out in defiance of the Prime Minister's call to tow the party line. Will the Prime Minister exclude any consideration of the change Mr Kelly proposed to the order. pension assets Senator, test? Or, or Senator Wong on a point of order. I'd ask that the, this is her first question. I would ask that the usual courtesies, in addition to the standing orders, be observed. And I'd request that this Senator be allowed to recommence the second supplementary. Um, I I, I, can I just rule on the point of order? Um, can I ask all senators? Uh, there have been a number of incidents about questions and first speeches. Just to remember the usual courtesies for senators mate, on their feet for the first time in this chamber, be it a qu first question or a first speech. I think that courtesy is important, um, without pointing fingers in any direction. Senator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. It is the Honourable uh, Senator's oh, first sorry. question. Sorry, I'm correct. Sorry, Senator Walsh hadn't finished. I'll let Senator Walsh recommence if she hadn't finished because I'd lost track. Senator Walsh. Uh, order, order. I don't think anyone. There's an element of glass houses and stone throwing about interjections around this chamber. So, um, and it has happened on a number of occasions this week. Senator Walsh, please recommence. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll start the question again. In an article entitled Liberal MP Craig Kelly Wants Family Home Included in Pension Assets Test, New Daily has reported that Mr Kelly has spoken out in defiance of the Prime Minister's call to tow the party line. Will the Prime Minister exclude any consideration of the change Mr Kelly proposed to the Pension Assets Test from his government's Retirement Incomes Review? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know, the Honourable Senator is asking her first question because if, if it was not her first question, she would have heard me say before, uh, don't believe everything you read in the newspaper. And even more importantly, don't believe everything you read in the New Daily, uh, is what I would say. Let me just say that uh, Mr. Kelly has hotly contested the report. Uh, he disputes the report. But for the avoidance of any doubt, let me also refer you uh, to uh, one of those great tw uh, tweets uh, from our uh, Treasurer, uh, Josh Fry when he um, has made very clear that Labor's claim that the pension assets test will be changed to include the value of the family home is a lie. Order. It's not our policy Senator and Cormann. never Senator will be. And on, Senator Cormann, please resume your seat. I'm Senator sorry, Wong on a question point question of order. Senator Wong on the point of order. Point of order is the actual question is whether the Prime Minister will explicitly exclude consideration of this policy from the review you have announced. Um, I, I think, with respect, Senator Wong, Senator Cormann quoting the Treasurer, who has portfolio responsibility about that matter, is being directly relevant to the question. 
Let me be very clear. The question is based on a completely false premise, which has been rejected. And I've been very, I've been very explicit. I've been very explicit. There will be absolutely no change to include the value of the family home uh, in uh, the uh, pension asset test. It's not our policy, and never will be. And the treasurer has made that extremely clear on behalf of the government. And you knew it. Order, Senator Davey. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Minister Mackenzie. Minister, can you please outline to the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals in government is on the side of Australian farmers and supporting our rural and regional communities to grow their productivity and their profitability? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator Davey, for your question. And I know as a proud New South Wales irrigator who grows rice uh, in, on your farm and also the occasional mung, green, mung bean crop. Uh, you're very interested about our government's plans to grow the profitability and productivity of our primary producers. Regional Australia has long been the engine room for our economy, with over 31 per cent of our annual GDP coming from regional Australia in 2016-17. In fact, since we've come to government, Australia's total farm production has come, gone up 25 per cent. And this is because we recognise that our farmers can grow the best produce in the world and feed the world. 75 per cent of the food and fibre produced in our regional areas is actually exported, and Australian farmers feed 40 million people across the world. In fact, the value of ag exporters has estimated at $48.981 million in 17-18, up almost 29 per cent since we've come to office. And Senator Birmingham touched on some of the reasons for that increase in exports for agriculture and the subsequent increase in local jobs around regional Australia, and that is because of the free trade agreements our government has signed. We've also invested $51.3 million to continue to grow our agricultural exports and seize market opportunities in global food chains to support market access requests. Maintaining our biosecurity, though, as a nation and our pest and disease-free status is the central value proposition to underpin that export growth, and it is something that our government has invested significantly in. Uh, we also continue to partner with the taxpayer and levy growers uh, to have a world-class research and development facility to increase innovation on farm and increase prop profitability. Our government has prioritised Order, farmers. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, how important is it to ensure that the government continues to support our farmers who are experiencing devastating drought? Senator McKenzie. Well, it's incredibly important because it will rain again, and we want our farmers in drought-affected areas, such as your home state of New South Wales, that when the rains do come, uh, that they can get back on their feet, restock quickly, replant quickly, and continue to grow that produce and export to the world. And that's why it's fantastic that Parliament, the Senate today, uh, passed the Future Drought Fund as part of our more than $7 billion drought response for rural and regional communities, delivering ongoing, immediate and future responses to assist with overcoming the impact of droughts. But for all the posturing from elected leaders about the need to support drought-affected farmers, only the Liberal National Government steps up when it counts. Prior to the election, the Greens announced an agriculture policy with a $100 million worth of support for drought-affected communities each year. And I quote, we need a plan for agriculture that looks beyond the next election cycle, where you had the chance to vote for it today, and you rejected Order, that. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, what risks are being faced by our agricultural sector, sector and how can the government help to minimise these risks? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you. I think the Greens actually will have an opportunity to stand up for Australian farmers when uh, the changes to the criminal code around agricultural protections and illegal farm activists uh, comes to the Senate. And I look forward to them uh, supporting us in that. The front page of the Weekly Times today goes to a Victorian farmer whose family were harassed multiple times over several weeks to the point of having to actually take the decision to quit farming. And I quote, they had hoodies on, we couldn't see their faces, 70 activists broke into our farm 
They said they had an ongoing effect uh, on the mental health, particularly, of his family. And the resultant impact was that over 300 uh, chickens, the stock, actually suffocated from a result of those animal activists. Enough is enough. For us to actually grow this industry, increase regional jobs in our communities, we need to support our farmers and stop the illegal uh, acts instead of encouraging Order. them, as Senator, Senator Dean Natale did Time on Insiders this week. Expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is again to Senator Birmingham, and I refer to Minister Taylor's statement yesterday that he has, and I quote, no association with Jamland Proprietary Limited, end quote. Does the minister stand by that statement? Minister, uh, Senator Birmingham. Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, firstly, uh, it was not my statement. It was not my statement to stand by. Uh, secondly, uh, secondly, I'll uh, check the record in terms of whether or not uh, that is a direct quote. Uh, what I would say, Mr. President, uh, is that Minister Taylor's indirect interest in Jamland has been widely reported. Uh, it is also well known that the minister's shareholding in Guffey Proprietary Limited. Uh, has been recorded on the minister's statement of interests. Uh, the fact that Guffey then holds shareholding in Jamland Proprietary Limited uh, is a matter that is on public record, such as those that Senator Wong has tabled uh, in the Senate. Uh, the declarations, as required by the House or the Senate, are for declarations of direct interests, not indirect interests. Uh, and Minister Taylor has complied with those requirements. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister Porter, in question time uh, today, has contradicted uh, the assertion that minister, the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction made in the House that he had no association with Jamland Proprietary Limited, saying, quote, there has never been any dispute that the minister has a relationship with the company, end quote. Does the minister stand by that statement? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I draw the Senator's attention to uh, the declared interests that uh, Minister Taylor made to the House in relation to Jamland Proprietary Limited, uh, sorry, in relation to Guffey Proprietary Limited, uh, which in turn holds shares in Jamland Proprietary Limited. Uh, the declaration was made in accordance with the rules of the House, according to the advice I'm provided. Senator Wong, final supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Minister Taylor said uh, short, a short time ago in the House that his interest in Jamland was declared in accordance with the rules. Given that the ministerial statements, declaration of interest and the register of the interest in the House make no mention of Jamland Proprietary Limited, could the minister please refer us to where the minister actually declared that interest? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr President, uh, as I just explained to the Senate, uh, the rules require uh, that direct interests be declared. Uh, Minister Taylor, I understand, has declared his interests in Guffey Proprietary Limited in accordance with the rules. Guffey Proprietary Limited uh, has shareholdings in Jamland Proprietary Limited. Uh, declarations were made in accordance with the rules that direct interests, that direct interests be declared. Uh, that is the case. Indeed, I'm sure uh, there would be members, senators throughout the parliament who may have shareholdings uh, in listed companies or others that would have indirect interests then in other companies. The point is the rules require declaration where you have a direct interest. Minister Taylor made that declaration. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills and Small and Family Business. Can the minister update the Senate about the recent jobs fairs held in North Queensland and how these job fairs are helping Australians get into jobs. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Canavan. Oh, well, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Stoker for that question and uh, recognise, I believe, that Senator Stoker was there and, and opened the Cairns job fair last month. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I couldn't make it. I understand it was a terrific success. Uh, around 33 exhibitors and over 700 jobs on offer. Uh, almost, I think, 1,300 people through the doors of the jobs fair there in Kansas. One of three jobs fairs that the uh, government has put on in the past few months, including ones in Townsville and Wide Bay. And it's all part of making sure uh, that we connect North Queenslanders and all Australians with the job opportunities that we are growing uh, in North Queensland and right through our country. Uh, recently in North Queensland, uh, we have, uh, over the past uh, year and a bit, 
uh, made significant announcements and investments through the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility. Uh, just the other week, uh, we announced an over $600 million loan to, to GenX to help build a massive power station in North Queensland. It will create 510 jobs. Uh, we've also made an investment at James Cook University in a techno technology innovation centre. There will be 270 jobs there, and, uh, and, uh, and an investment in the Townsville Airport to upgrade the terminal there. Another 267 jobs there. In addition to those investments through the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility, the Northern Australian Roads Program has, is in the process of upgrading significant road infrastructure in North Queensland, including the Han Highway, creating the first inland sealed route from Cairns to Melbourne, cutting eight hours off the journey. And, uh, Right across northern Australia, those roads programs have supported or are supporting more than 2,000 jobs being created. Uh, Senator, Mr. President, our government is focused on jobs. It is one of our, it's our number one focus when it comes to the economy because we know uh, that having a job allows you to provide for your children, allows you to pay for your home, allows you to think about other things you will do to support your family and create a better environment for your children. It is a prerequisite to create a better Australia and better communities right across Australia, and that's why we fight for jobs, we create jobs, and we're doing all we can to, to keep jobs, job growth strong. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Minister, why is it so important to focus on bringing jobs to North Queensland? Senator Canavan. Uh, well, Mr. President, um, uh, in particular, um, I recognise and the government recognises that it has been a difficult few years in, in North Queensland uh, on the jobs front. Uh, a few years ago, there was a significant mining downturn in other parts of North Queensland, like Cairns. There's been it's been a tough time for the tourism industry when there was a high Australian dollar. Um, but there, is, there has been good recent news. We have been working hard uh, to bring job-creating projects like the ones I mentioned in the, in the first answer, and, and there has been uh, significant improvement recently. Over the past year, uh, unemployment in Cairns is, is down to 4.7 per cent, a 1.7 percentage point reduction over the past year in the Townsville region. Uh, an area that's had high unemployment recently. We, the rate has fallen recently to a bit, still too high, 7.1 per cent, but a 2.1 percentage point reduction over the past year, and in Wide Bay, 7.5 per cent, a 2 percentage point reduction. Uh, we are focused on making sure that we target these areas of high unemployment to bring more jobs to people in them. Yep. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any alternate approaches to creating jobs in North Queensland? Senator Canavan. Well, uh, Mr. President, the, the biggest issue we have in, in North Queensland, indeed in many uh, areas of our country we're seeking to grow and develop, uh, continues to be uh, those that want to run an agenda that don't want to use our resources or don't want to develop our country, uh, those that are, are risk averse and uh, have a narrow minded thinking and view that we shouldn't uh, continue to develop our nation, we shouldn't build dams or, or, or create new mines or help, help grow our farming sector. Those, those that have those views are the biggest barrier to job growth in North Queensland and right across uh, regional Australia in particular, those that haven't supported the Adani Carmichael mine. They'll wear that like a millstone in North Queensland now for years because they weren't there backing the development of the Galilee Basin when it was crucial and needed. They weren't on the side of North Queensland. They are still not on the side, Mr President. The Labor Party is still not on the side of building dams in North Queensland. They're not partnering with us to get the big rocks we built and bring thousands of jobs to North Queensland. Until they do, until they do, the people of North Queensland know that Labor is not on their side. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Uh, Madam, Acting Deputy, uh, Madam Deputy President, my apologies. I rise to take note of the answers provided by Senators Birmingham and Cormann the questions asked by Senators Wong and O'Neill. Now, over the last two days, Senators Birmingham and Cormann have been asked on multiple occasions to explain the circumstances surrounding Mr Taylor and Mr Frydenberg and the meetings that they secured with the department about grass clearing in the, uh, grasslands in the Monaro area. And it is striking. It's striking how unwilling they have been to add even the tiniest amount of detail to this story, and it's a big tell. I haven't been in this parliament, in this chamber, for as long as some of these people, but I have been around long enough to know that when you get answers like the ones that are being provided, there is a cover-up going on. People are scrambling 
The senators who have been answering questions in this place have been desperate to keep their hands off this. Every answer they have provided has referred to statements made by Minister Taylor, referred to statements made by Minister Frydenberg. They have been completely unwilling to verify with any confidence the set of facts asserted around these circumstances, and that is because they are impossible to reconcile based on the available evidence. It is probably useful to set out some of the facts as they have been reported. In October 2016, it is reported that almost 30 hectares of critically endangered grasslands were cleared uh, in the Monaro area after the land was bought by Jamland Proprietary Limited. In November, a complaint is made by neighbours to the New South Wales and Federal Environment Authorities, and on 7 March 2017, the Federal Department of the Environment meets with representatives of Jamland to discuss potential contraventions of federal environment laws. That's what's been reported. And we now know from documents obtained under FOI that on the 9th of March, just two days after that first meeting, when the environment officers go and meet with Jamland, a meeting is sought by staff in Minister Frydenberg's offices, office with officers from the department to discuss land clearing. I reiterate, the coincidence is striking, isn't it? Within a day, within a day of that first contact between the department and Jamland, the minister's office is on the case, seeking a meeting from the department. And an assistant secretary the following day is emailing his colleagues talking about this call and quite clearly flagging concerns and anxieties about the position that the department is being placed in by the minister's staff. And on the 20th of March 2017, a meeting in Parliament House with Mr Taylor takes place in relation to this listing of critically endangered species. And at the request of Minister Frydenberg, a compliance officer from the department is present at the meeting. Well, why does it matter? It's complicated, isn't it? But the whole affair stinks. It stinks of the kind of insider dealings that drives people nuts. And the facts, as reported, give rise to very serious questions in relation to the ministerial standards, those standards that require our ministerial representatives to be honest, that require them to separate the public interest from their private interests. Serious questions about whether the ministers in question were acting in the public interest or instead were acting to protect the interests of one minister and his family and their interest in a particular company, Jamland. There's been a discussion today about disclosure as though that's enough. The facts on the table about disclosure suggest that not at all enough has been done. Not, in, not all of the obligations have in any way been met. Documents tabled today show that Guffey, the company in which Minister Taylor is listed as a shareholder and an officer, has a clear financial interest in Jamland. Something you think might have been made public, might have been made known to the departmental officers who were involved in the meeting between Mr. Minister Taylor uh, and, and Minister Frydenberg. But no, because in April, during estimates, the secretary of the department couldn't have been clearer. He said, Senator, in answer to a question, I can be quite explicit about this. I am not aware that the minister is a shareholder. I do not know that information. Minister Taylor has never raised that issue with me. Ought not the secretary of the department been informed that the minister he was meeting with had a direct financial relationship with the company against whom an investigation was taking place. This is not good enough. Thank you, uh, Senator McAllister. Senator Fiavanti Wells. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, it's all very good the hypocrisy, uh, Senator McAllister, of you to come into this place, given, given the history of the ALP and the scandals that you've been involved in. So it's a bit hypocritical of you to come into uh, this place and make those sort of assertions. And I'll tell you why the, those opposite are doing this, because they have just suffered a really bad defeat at the hands of the Australian public. We won the election. You lost the election, 
And why did you lose the election? Because it's good for those opposite. They want to come in here and they want to throw a bit of mud. They want to do this. They want to do that. Because, because they, because, because you do not want to admit that at the last federal election you took to the Australian public a series of dud policies, and that's why you lost the election. And I'd like to focus on that. You don't want to talk about some of the swings that you suffered, particularly in my home state of New South Wales. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Wong. Point of order. Relevance. Uh, uh, I know that there seems to be a reluctance to defend Minister Taylor, but that is actually the question, the answer on which we're taking note. Thank you, Senator Wong. I do remind uh, senators that uh, we are taking note on questions uh, from Senator Wong and Senator O'Neill to Senator Birmingham and Cormann. And whilst this is a wide-ranging debate, uh, it is appropriate to address uh, that subject matter. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, and I would refer. Uh, in direct answer to uh, that point of order, to the comments that were made and to the answers that were given uh, by Senator Cormann and Senator Birmingham in relation to comments that have been made both here and in relation to what has been said in the House. I've been here. I haven't heard what has happened in the House. So, Madam Deputy uh, President, it is very clear that uh, Minister Taylor Minister Taylor, Minister Taylor has indicated to the parliament that he has complied with his obligations. Those are the comments of Minister Taylor, and I accept those comments, and we should accept them as well. Now, as I was saying, those opposite are very happy now to want to steer away from the loss at the election. And I, I was focusing, Madam Deputy President, on some of the swings that happened in some of the seats in uh, my home state of New South Wales. And uh, the Hunter, almost 10 per cent. Chipley, almost 7 per cent. Patterson, almost 6 per cent. Shortland, almost 5.5 per cent. McMahon, almost 5.5 per cent. Blacksland, almost 5 per cent. No, you don't want to talk about that. You don't want to talk about the fact uh, about your policies in, in relation to abolishing negative gearing, where you went around Australia and you talked about the top end of town, where most of the people who negatively gear property in this country are on an average salary of about $85,000. Uh, and, and those people who negatively gear properties do so to get property for their children and for the inheritance of their children in most cases. Franking credits. You are attacking hard-working retirees. But Senator, do Senator Fia Van der Bels, I have been listening carefully, and whilst you did come back to uh, the taking note topic, I would just remind you again that we are uh, taking note is uh, about questions from Senators Wong and O'Neill to Senators Birmingham and Cormann. Madam Deputy President, I thought that I addressed that quite adequately. Uh, Senator Siavanta Wells, you did momentarily, and then you. Well, I'm happy to do so again. And as I've said, Minister Taylor has made comments in the other place. Senator Cormann and Sen Senators Cormann and Birmingham have made comments in this place, and uh, I agree with what Senator Cormann and Senator Birmingham have said. And I would refer the Senate to those comments. And as I was saying. Uh, in particular, in relation to uh, those opposite and their loss at the last federal election, it's interesting to see in seats like Hunter, where you've had an almost 10 per cent swing, and your assault on the coal industry was really interesting. And as I was standing on polling booths in the state election, people came up to me whinging about the Labor Party. I and mean, this is supposed to be your heartland. It's supposed to be a centre where the coal industry is so important, and people voted against you because of the assault on the coal industry. Of course, there was the issue of religious freedom, which manifested itself also in the, through the Falau uh, sacking. But quiet Australians, that silent majority, those quiet Australians rejected your policies. You have to accept that. You have to accept 
that you lost the election. So no amount of mud raking or mud slinging is actually going to detract from that fact that the Australian public rejected your policies, they elected us. They didn't want a return to the fiscal vandalism that we had for six years in this country when you were on the Treasury benches and you, Senator Wong, in particular, as the Finance Minister, gave us fiscal Thank you, vandalism. Senator Fiavanti Wells. Your time has expired. I would um, again ask you, if you're taking note again, to please um, remain broadly around the topic. It is not acceptable just to make one statement and then move completely away from the topic. I think I was quite lenient, but I would ask you to um, reflect on what taking note is about. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I too rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Birmingham to the questions of uh, Senators Wong and, and um, O'Neill. And, and, and it, just, it was bemusing that contribution from Senator Ferravanti Wells, but it reminded me of the tweet from the doyen of the press gallery, Michelle Grattan, I think, yesterday, which said, when confronted by a question, answer a completely different one. That is the oldest deployment of political tactics in the book. So well done, Sarah Vandy Wells, Senator Firavandi Wells. I'm not sure Minister Taylor would take a great deal of comfort from your less than robust defence of his invidious position. But I listened carefully to Senator Birmingham, who said, to the best of my knowledge. And that's often the statement from the honourable member for uh, North Queensland, Senator Catter, when asked about his uh, wife's interests, he said, well, the best of my knowledge I know nothing. You know, it's, it's the type of evasive answer, when in trouble, try and move yourself away from the problem. And there is a problem here. And it's a discrete problem that arises in this chamber and in the other chamber because of the quite appropriate scrutiny of these declarations. They're important democratic uh, declarations. People in the community need to know if there is conflict or the potential for conflict. If you have an interest in, or a financial interest in, a decision-making uh, portfolio and it affects your own interests, it's got to be declared. It's a simple principle right throughout democratic society and good governance and due diligence. Minister Taylor seems to attract this lack of appropriate declaration. There are allegations around involvement in water pricing and contracts and sales. Now we have clear trail of evidence wanting to be tabled in the Senate. The, the government has said no, do it through the appropriate way, and I'm sure that is exactly what will happen. But I fill out a senator's declaration of interest, and it's quite specific. There's you know, a handbook to tell you how to do it. And Senator Birmingham said, only direct interests need to be mentioned. Well, that's not what the instructions to members of parliament say. It is any beneficial interest, whether held by yourself, your partner, your brother, through an investment in another trust. You know, the, the public need to know that the ministerial standards are being upheld and the appropriate standards for members of parliament, either in the House of Representatives or the Senate, are being upheld. The, the, the period is on now. The parliament has restarted. Uh, in the Senate, we have till the 30th of June to comply with those uh, published uh, registrable statements of interest. This minister has a hang-up from previous parliaments. It will be really instructive to see whether the new declaration actually improves his record-keeping and makes it a bit easier for the manager of government business and for the leader of the Senate to actually defend him. Because I didn't see any resounding you know, defence of uh, Minister Taylor. I think he's done the right thing. To the best of my knowledge, he's done the right thing. And then Sarah, Senator Fear of Andy Wells came in and spoke about something completely different. So she obviously has no confidence that he's actually done the right thing because she never went within a skerrick of addressing the matter before the chamber. But it is the most vitally important thing that should be complied with at the start of each parliament and maintained right throughout the parliament and should act in conjunction with the ministerial standards. And if we go to the ministerial standards of conduct by those opposite, it is contended that Minister Pine, that Minister Bishop, that Minister Robb, and the list goes on, have not exactly covered themselves in glory in honouring those are high ministerial standards. 
They have left the parliament, gone into great jobs within a really quick time frame, which looks to be dubious in terms of the standards. So those on the other side don't have a good record here. And have a serving minister have allegations about this is not only untidy, it's completely inappropriate. He should have the professionalism, the honesty and you know, transparency to properly disclose in the 110 per cent way that's required by the Australian people all of his registrable interests to avoid the possibility of these allegations of you know, undue and improper uh, interference in either the bureaucracy or in the way that legislation is enacted in this country. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator McGrath. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I think our Minister Taylor has been very strong in defending his, his actions, has, along with the, the ministers uh, Cormann and ministers Birmingham in, in question time today, been very, very strong in defending Minister Taylor. You know, uh, Minister Taylor has stated quite clearly, quite clearly that he has not made representations to federal or state ministers in relation to his family investment company or to any federal or state government department officials. But what this shows, what this shows is that, that what do Labor have to ask questions about? They're not going to ask questions about policy. They're not going to ask questions about substantive issues. What they're doing, we're seeing a classic 101 from Labor, run around and, and, and throw a little bit of dirt and water and hope it, turn, it turns into mud. And that, that is disappointing, disappointing that when the people of Australia on, on the 18th of May made an informed decision about who they want to see sit in the lodge and who they want to see be in, in executive power in this country, that, that a party who failed to win—and I've been there, I've lost more elections than, than most people in this place—have failed to come to terms with the decision of the quiet Australians. And instead of understanding that, what, they, what they've done, Madam Deputy President, is that they're getting this, this dirt in this water and, and want to throw some mud around in relation to, to, to Minister Taylor. Now, Minister Taylor's indirect interest in Jamland Proprietary Limit has been widely reported in the media and has been declared in accordance with the rules. Simple. But this isn't stopping. This isn't stopping uh, our friends in the Labor Party. This isn't stopping those who, because of this, this policy vacuum, this vortex that exists on, 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 on that side of the chamber at the moment, that what they want to do is they want to, want to chase after people when there is actually nothing, nothing there to, to, to look at. Minister Taylor and Ministers uh, Cormann and Ministers uh, uh, Birmingham have been very clear in relation to, to the conduct and the compliance uh, with, with the rules. And it is disappointing because this parliament, in this question time, there should be serious questions put to, to, to ministers, put to, to, to the government, about policy issues. And we'd welcome those questions. We'd, we'd welcome questions in terms of, of what the government is doing to help, help Queenslanders, to help Australians, what we're doing in terms of, of cutting taxes and how that is helping, helping Queenslanders and Australians, what we are doing in terms of, of, of drought, what we are doing in terms of and, you know, drought is this, this, this probably, it's probably the worst drought that, that Australia has, has had in, in, in recorded history. And I know in my, my home state of Queensland that, that you know, there are still some, some children in, in parts of Queensland who are yet to actually experience precipitation falling on their head. They've yet to experience uh, the magic that, that is rain because their property, their, their, their hometown is yet to receive, receive rain. And this is part of, of, of the brutality that is the Australian climate. But there are no questions about drought, no questions about how that is impacting upon rural and regional Queensland and how it is impacting upon, upon those in the cities. Instead, sadly, we have questions uh, addressed to, to ministers um, with, with, with um, impugning the conduct of, of ministers in relation to how they have made declarations in their register of interest. And, and Minister Taylor has been so clear, it's so clear. Uh, that the minister has been uh, totally in accordance with the register of interest. 
And Minister Taylor has provided assurance that he is in no association with the compliance action and has never been made representation in relation to it. And this was confirmed, this was confirmed at Senate estimates by the Secretary of his Department in April of this year. So the Secretary of the Department has confirmed this. The register of interests has been complied with. And yet, yet sadly, uh, Labor wished to, to use question time, to fill up question time with, with these questions. Uh, waste question time. Thank you, Senator Smith. Instead of, and I'm sure uh, the front bench will probably get annoyed with me. Instead of asking serious, hard questions about about policies, what we're seeing for, from Labor is the throwing, the throwing of mud, the use of, of dirt and water, mixing it together in the good old uh, union jug, and throwing it at those evil Tories on the other side of the chamber. And that is sad. It is a sad reflection upon the modern Labor Party, and it actually is an indication of one of the reasons why they failed to connect with the quiet Australians on the 18th of May. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Well, if Senator McGrath calls that a strong performance from Senator Cormann and Senator Birmingham, I'd hate to see a weak one. Um, because when you compare the performance of Senator Birmingham and Senator Cormann uh, defending uh, Angus Taylor, uh, Minister Taylor today compared to yesterday, um, a vastly different performance from Senators Birmingham and Cormann. Um, they obviously know uh, that the minister has been less than truthful in terms of how he has presented himself uh, to the House of Representatives on these important issues. And I think at the end of the day, what this comes down to and what we're starting to see emerge from this government is arrogance. Uh, we know they won the election. We saw the, the contribution from Senator Fiorianti Wells, uh, where she came in and all she could talk about was um, the election. I mean, at least Senator McGrath spent a minute longer um, talking about McGrath, but it was a very lame defence of the minister, and that's the same that we saw from Senator Cormann and Birmingham as well. Uh, but this is an arrogant government, and this is an arrogant minister. Because what they think is that the standards don't apply to them. Uh, we see that with former ministers, Pine, we see that with former minister uh, Julie Bishop, uh, about the way they have behaved post the election in terms of going about and basically disregarding the ministerial standards, and the government have been prepared to defend them on that. And then again this week we see with Minister Taylor, again the government prepared to defend him. Uh, it certainly was a different attitude today, though, in the Senate, where they were certainly not as strong in their defence of uh, Minister Taylor uh, in this chamber. Uh, but what we know uh, and what has been established is that uh, there's basically two key phrases that Minister Taylor has used over the last couple of days. Uh, the first one was he's had no association, and the second one was he has been at arm's length. And I just wanted to go to those because I think that they are important. Uh, what we've seen and what the evidence that has been provided in question time today around no association. Uh, what we now know is that uh, Minister Taylor was a director of Goofy, uh, which has a joint one-third interest in Jamland Proprietary Limited. Uh, and Jamland Proprietary Limited um, has been uh, investigated by the minister's own department, so the minister's own department of energy and environment. Uh, when it comes to illegal land clearing and the poisoning of critically endangered native grassland in October 2016. So uh, it is clear that the minister has an association with this property. Um, so no more can the minister rely on no association um, for him to try and claim that he had no association with this property that has been under investigation by this department. And the second one around arm's length. Now, I think for Minister Taylor, he takes arm lengths literally. Um, in, that, in the meeting, he thinks I was more than an arm length, arm's length away. Um, obviously, um, it is a dra vastly different scenario when uh, we know that he has an interest in this property and we also know that he organised a meeting that he was at with his own department um, where these issues were raised. So no longer can he rely on uh, no association. Uh, no longer can he say that he was at arm's length. Uh, when we know that he was involved in a meeting where this issue uh, was brought up. So it became clear today from uh, the performance of Senator Birmingham and Senator Cormann that they changed tack from the way they answered questions yesterday, um, where they tried to appear quite confident. Today they were very cautious in their defence of, of Minister Taylor. 
Um, we also saw Senator Fiorenti Wells didn't try and defend Minister Taylor, and we also saw with Senator McGrath he danced around a couple of issues but wasn't prepared to defend Minister Taylor in this chamber as well. And what we know is that uh, we will continue to pursue these issues. Um, because we think that ministerial standards are important. We think that ministerial standards and accountability is important. But we also know that this arrogant government, if, we, if they aren't held to account, will continue that level of arrogance and will continue to go down that path where they treat the voters with contempt and they take issues of accountability and don't treat them seriously at all. But at the end of the day, and where this will ultimately end up with, as we continue to pursue these issues, as we continue to pursue uh, Minister Taylor in this House and in the other chamber as well, uh, and they will end up with the Prime Minister. Uh, and he is the one who is responsible for this government. Um, he is the one who has been arrogant post his election result. Uh, and again, I think on this issue of accountability when it comes to Minister Taylor, when it comes to previous ministers, uh, the Prime Minister needs to show some leadership on this issue and ensure that this Thank minister you, answers Senator the question. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, uh, President. Uh, I rise to uh, take note of an answer given by the Foreign Minister. Well, last night, uh, the ABC's Four Corners dedicated an episode to the appalling human rights uh, Sorry, last Monday night's uh, Four Corners dedicated an episode to the appalling human rights abuses that are occurring in China's Xinjiang region right now, while the world watches on. Xinjiang has a Turkish uh, Muslim population of uh, 13 million people. Out of that 13 million, approximately 1 million are arbitrarily detained without any legal process. They're detained for weeks months and sometimes even years. Families have been torn apart. Those incarcerated are subject to forced labour, sometimes to torture and to forced political indoctrination. Outside the camps, Uyghurs and other Turkish Muslims are denied the right to freedom of movement, to privacy and to freedom of religion. The mass surveillance that is occurring in Xinjiang is terrifying. People going about their lawful daily business are watched constantly by the state. They're forced to give their biometric data, and face and voice recognition technology is being used as a tool of repression. The revelation in four corners that Australian universities seem to be complicit in the development of this technology is even more appalling. And of course, Four Corners showed us the Australian human face of this devastating repression thanks to the bravery of those who spoke out. And we acknowledge them. It brought us the story of Saddam Abu Salamu's wife, Nadila, and his toddler, Latfi, who were trapped in Xinjiang. Through no fault of their own, Nadila and Latfi were separated from Saddam before Latfi's birth, and the Chinese authorities have prevented them from being reunited. Saddam has never met his son. He wasn't there to support his wife through the last part of her pregnancy. He didn't witness his son's birth. He says he's totally broken mentally, financially and physically. It is a great relief that Lutfi has been granted Australian citizenship and that the Foreign Minister has intervened to call for Saddam's family to be permitted to travel to Australia. What is required now is for Nadilla's visa to be fast-tracked and for the government to keep up the pressure on the Chinese government. And of course, many other Australian Uyghurs are affected by China's brutal crackdown. Almas Nizamuddin's mum is interred in a camp, and his wife is imprisoned simply for studying in Egypt. Amnesty International classifies her as a prisoner of conscience, and she's waiting for a spousal visa, which must also be fast-tracked. There are more than 30,000 Uyghurs in Australia. In some form or other, all of these people have a friend or relative in a camp. The Greens are calling on the government to take urgent action in the face of what is cultural genocide. The Australian government's decision to sign on to a joint statement at the UN Human Rights Council 
was welcome. Indeed, I said that to the minister during question time. But we must do more. It was disappointing that the minister was unable to provide me with a concrete number of Australian citizens who are currently detained. And it was also disappointing that the minister couldn't detail in her answer to my question what concrete steps the government will be taking to pressure China to stop this campaign of repression. Of course, we need to work with other countries in our region to make sure that independent monitors have access to Xinjiang. But we need to do more. We need to show some courage. We need to show some leadership. We should be implementing targeted sanctions like visa bans and asset freezes against those individuals who are linked to these abuses. Australia has in the past be, been a leading voice on human rights in the international arena. Over recent years, we have been absent when it comes to ensure, ensuring that human rights are protected around the world. If there was ever a time for Australia to start actually leading the way on human rights abuses, it is now. The question is the motion moved by Senator Di Natale be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.